that uh, introduction. Um, and hi, everyone. Nice to see all of your names printed out and uh, some of you I see faces. Uh, let me see, share screen. Um, so I assume uh, you can all see my screen here. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give a little bit of a, a, a little bit of a didactic uh, lecture, um, but I do encourage you to um, interrupt me if you have uh, questions or points of discussion. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, we'll see how it goes. I thought I'd start um, very briefly just to introduce myself uh, because I'm actually not going to talk about my um, the research, the empirical research that we do in my lab. Uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, some um, data analysis or one data analysis family in particular. Uh, so who is Mike Cohen? Well, you know, I started off uh, looking something like this. And through the years, I, I transitioned into this, and now I'm an associate uh, professor at the Donners Institute. So you can see the effects of gravity happening over time. Basically, the hair just goes down from the head onto the face. So time, uh, you know, gravity and, and time are inextricably linked. So um, yeah, it's, there's, there's no fighting it. Um, actually, when I first went to university, I wasn't studying neuroscience. I started off studying music and, and music theory, um, which is super interesting, but uh, that didn't really pique my interest. So I, I transitioned into um, psychology and then into neuroscience and uh, then into uh, or cognitive neuroscience. And uh, now my lab is focused on systems neuroscience. We use um, uh, electrophysiological methods in, in combination with genetic tools that allow us to um, interrogate, so manipulate and uh, or regulate, up and down regulate, and also record from um, populations of cells and uh, local field potential and EEG, um, while, uh, yeah, sort of um, to try and um, understand a little bit more about how um, neural circuits in the brain use electrical signaling, in particular rhythmic activity, to implement synchronization um, within regions and, uh, and across different uh, brain regions. Um, topically, uh, the focus of the research in my group over now like 15 years or so has been kind of on uh, a response conflict monitoring, which is basically the process that's engaged when I tell you to um, say the color that this word is printed in. So you have to say green, even though you have this, you know, automatic tendency to say the word blue to just read the text, but you're supposed to say green. So that generates response conflict. Um, and that ignites this whole cascade of activity that's called midfrontal theta. Uh, it's measured from EEG. It, this um, feature of the data uh, or of brain signal has been known for, I guess, around 15, 20 years or so. Um, we have studied it. Uh, my colleagues and collaborators have, have done quite a bit of research about it. That's a whole different, you know, the whole story behind this is a separate one hour long talk. So uh, just giving you a, a tiny bit of background, uh, but that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's not what I'm really going to talk about. What we're doing in my uh, research group these days, the past couple of years, is trying to understand a little bit of the neural circuitry, some of the circuit uh, mechanisms and dynamics that underlie this feature that we can measure non-invasively with EEG. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty hard uh, problem to solve. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of what we're um, focus on. That's the empirical stuff, you know, empirical uh, new experiments and new data, you know, that's that's how you get funding. Unfortunately, that's kind of the only way to get funding. Um, but, you know, that's uh, that's actually, to be totally honest, um, my real passion in neuroscience is um, data analysis methods. So testing, evaluating, tweaking, improving, and teaching about data analysis methods. That, that's something I, I really um, get uh, passionate about. And, and those of you who know me through my teaching can uh, won't be surprised to hear that. Why is this important? Data analysis methods. I'm, uh, you know, this is kind of um, answered. That's kind of the subtext of the rest of my uh, presentation. But there's a lot of data analysis methods, novel data analysis methods that are imported from other fields. Um, and there are other methods that are developed and introduced by theorists, so mathematicians, um, or like math heavy physicists. And, you know, that that's kind of great. I mean, we do need more um, data analysis methods, I think, in, um, in neuroscience. But the thing is, a lot of data analysis methods 
are simply brought into neuroscience or introduced to neuroscience without real um, testing and without real evaluation in empirical neural data. Um, and the reason why this is important is that an analysis method that works in theory in, you know, in, in math um, or, you know, in, in, you know, signal engineering does not necessarily go, is not necessarily going to be a, an optimal or useful data analysis method in neural data, because in neural data, we have very specific types of um, problems that we uh, work with. The data have specific types of noise and so on. And so analysis method that works great in theory is not necessarily going to work great in practice, uh, or sometimes it needs some tweaking. And so, yeah, that's kind of uh, what I'm, uh, one of the things that I'm interested in that we focus on in my lab. One of the most consistent themes of uh, the development of neuroscience and neuroscience technology is that we are getting more data uh, and the data are getting better and we are acquiring those data faster. So it's more and more data, better data and faster data. Here you see this is a plot of the number of simultaneously recorded neurons as a function of time. And so this is increasing. Now they describe this with the linear function. Also, this, this paper was published a decade ago. Um, so to my eye, you know, I, I don't think this is really, um, uh, um, I, I think this is an exponential function, not really a, a linear function, but it, it doesn't really matter. The, the numbers don't matter. You, you, the point is, is pretty clear. So with single units, people are recording, so, you know, individual neurons, people are recording uh, hundreds at a time nowadays. EEG, we're, you know, sort of regularly going from uh, 16 channels to uh, 256 channels. It's not even so unusual anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the evidence suggests actually that we that with 256 channels on the head, we still haven't reached the spatial Nyquist frequency of EEG. So even something like 512 uh, EEG electrodes is still is still going to provide unique and um, and insightful information. Um, the resolution of MRI is also increasing. Uh, these are just some silly pictures I found, but uh, the voxel sizes are getting smaller in part because the field size, uh, the field strength is of MRIs is getting stronger. And um, uh, SNR is increasing and that allows us to record um, activity, bold activity from smaller voxels at higher temporal resolution. And optical imaging, you know, this field really exploded in the past decade. And now people are able to record from 100,000 cells at the same time uh, in a zebrafish, for example. So that's that's pretty remarkable. So, you know, what do you do with all of these data? You have hundreds of thousands of cells or, or e even, you know, many dozens of cells. It can still become very overwhelming to know what to do with your large multivariate data sets. Um, so what do people do? Well, the traditional approach is uh, what's called univariate. Um, so uni because there's one uh, and, and, and variate. So this is really not about the measurement per se, but about the um, analysis approach. So the idea of a univariate analysis approach is that um, you analyze each individual, in this case, electrode, but you know this is just a depiction. It can be an MRI voxel or a neuron or um, a local field potential channel. Um, so you have uh, M channels, M data sources, uh, observable data sources, and then you, you perform M different analyses and you get M different results. Now, in my mind, this is like a, a philosophy. I think if you are analyzing your data this way, that is because you have a philosophical orientation uh, about uh, how the brain works, that each neuron should be analyzed separately or each electrode should be analyzed separately. Now, I wrote this in a, in a paper, uh, a manuscript over the summer, and there were three reviewers and three out of three reviewers gave me shit about using this term philosophy. So uh, I had to concede and I called it approach in the, the paper. But I do think that there really is a philosophical orientation. Um, but uh, well, that's a, a, a much uh, longer debate, I guess. So what, what is the uh, contrast to univariate? So the contrast is a multivariate analysis philosophy or approach. Uh, if you don't like that term, you can you know, just put your thumb on top of that screen here. So the idea of a multivariate approach is that rather than analyzing all of the individual electrodes or voxels or neurons, instead you come up with some weighted combination. Um, so the idea here is that 
you believe you have the orientation, the, the, the assumption that the important patterns in the signal are not present in individual neurons or individual electrodes. Instead, they are distributed, spatially distributed over the different electrodes. So therefore, what you do is come up with some weighted combination of, uh, of all of the observables, the, the, the manifest variables, and that actually reduces the total number of analyses that you have to do to you know one or two or three or you know some relatively small number compared to the total number of channels that you have. So uh, so it's a dimension reduction method, but that's because you know your assumption is that the important information is um, is distributed over these different channels. So why would you do this? Why would you do this approach? Many reasons. One is, you know, just kind of practical to reduce the dimensionality of extremely large data sets. But you know, I, I think there's more scientific motivations for moving towards multivariate analyses over univariate analyses. Um, right. So, so mechanistically, the idea is you analyze a relatively small number of components, which are defined as weighted combinations of the manifest variables. I'm going to talk a lot more about wh what this phrase means here, weighted combination in the next couple of slides. This really based on an assumption that neural coding or neural representations are spatiotemporally distributed. Uh, they can be sparse or, or dense, you know, that, that part doesn't really matter, it just kind of falls out in the math. But the assumption is that one individual neuron or one individual electrode is not the proper unit of measurement or is not the, the, uh, op, the, uh, the optimal unit of measurement. Instead, there is some computation some representation that is distributed over multiple things that you can measure, electrodes or neurons. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what we want is to identify those patterns and analyze those patterns and not the individual manifest variables. So if you buy this assumption, and I should be clear, this is just an assumption. Uh, I subscribe to this assumption, but that doesn't mean that it's correct, right? I mean, you know, what, what do I know about how the brain works? Uh, so if you buy into this assumption, then the implication is that measuring and analyzing only one, you know, manifest variable at a time is going to partially, maybe even entirely miss the pattern. At best, a univariate pattern is going to reduce the signal to noise ratio, uh, which means yeah, that your statistics are going to be uh, uh, a little bit less fruitful. Okay, so, uh, so it's a weighted combination. It's all about these weighted combinations. So how do you define the weights? Well, you know, that's where things start to get a little bit tricky. Um, basically, just to, uh, to identify weights, to define weights for each uh, channel, you have to optimize for something. Um, so there's different things you can optimize for, uh, cross-validation accuracy, variance, independence, and so on. Um, different uh, solutions to this problem, different multivariate approaches are going to optimize for different things. <clears throat> so it's decoding. MVPA is multivariate pattern analysis. PCA, you've probably heard of. ICA, you've probably heard of. Deep learning, I assume everyone uh, has heard of. Um, so these are all multivariate analysis approaches. I'll talk a little bit more about PCA uh, in, in a couple minutes. But mostly for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on something called generalized eigen decomposition. It's quite a mouthful. Um, so usually I just say GED. And here you're optimizing for something called a covariance contrast, or you're optimizing a, a covariance SNR. Now, just to be clear for people, you know, in the audience who are already familiar with these, I, I am never going to say that, you know, these methods are, are bad. Uh, these are all great methods. I'm a huge fan of any kind of multivariate approach to large data sets. I'm just going to focus on GED just in the interest of time and because I think this is a really underutilized framework that has a lot of untapped potential. Um, but I, I certainly don't mean to, uh, I'm not intentionally ignoring these other methods because I, I don't like them. So just to make that clear. All right, so a little bit more detail. Um, what are uh, linear spatial filters? So how do we define these components? So this is just, you know, putting some symbols onto this picture here. So the idea is that we take each uh, vector time series. So this would be V1, could be this one, V2 might be this one. So this would be the electrode time series or the spiking time series. And then we, we attach a single number to each of those. So we multiply this, maybe this weight value is one, maybe this is 0.1, maybe this is minus 3.2 or something. 
Um, so we take the weighted combinations, so we weight each data channel by some number, uh, and then add them all up. So we're summing up all of the data channels weighted, uh, you know, according to something. Um, and that gives us this vector C here for component. And that's just a single time series that reflects the sum of all of these channels. So the same thing um, here where X would be the data matrix and W would be the vector that contains all of these individu in individual uh, Ws or you know, omegas, whatever. Okay, so uh, assumption of linear filters. Notice, you know, we're not doing any logs or, or exponents or anything like that. So these are linear filters. Um, the assumption is that the sources mix linearly at the electrodes uh, or, you know, whatever the, the measurements uh, uh, devices are. Um, and the reason why we assume a linear mixing is because, yeah, it's a, it's a linear unmixing. Um, we could talk more about this assumption later. Basically, for electrophysiology, for electrical fields, this assumption is totally valid. Um, for other things like fMRI, uh, yeah, it's you have to assume that there's basically um, uh, a um, uh, an instantaneous and and linear um, transformation between the computation that you're interested in and how that computation manifests at your measurement variables. I think this is this is a, a easy assumption to, to make, uh, or a valid assumption. Okay, there's some other assumptions uh, about covariance, uh, stationarity, and having clean data and, and stuff like that, but that gets into details that we don't need to discuss. Okay, so I mentioned this term covariance a couple times. So this spatial filter, this multivariate approach that I'm going to talk about is all based on covariance matrices. So let me just take a moment to um, define what a covariance matrix is just to make sure we're all on the same page. So imagine this is uh, yeah, some uh, multivariate um, data set. And what we can do is compute the correlation between each pair of channels. So the correlation between these two channels, the correlation between these two channels, and you know every possible pair of channels, we can correlate them. And we can organize all of those correlations into a matrix. So channels by channels and the color at each location would correspond to the correlation between you know, this channel and this channel. So that would be a, uh, a correlation matrix. A covariance matrix is, uh, it's basically just the numerator of a correlation coefficient. I'll show that on the next slide, but covariance and correlation are more or less the same thing. A correlation is just the normalized uh, covariance. Um, so yeah, it, it's a it's a brilliant uh, thing. These covariance matrices are are really great because it's a compact representation of all of the um, linear interactions between all of the uh, channels. So all the pairwise linear interactions are contained in a covariance matrix. So it can it has a lot of of information packed into a relatively small um, small uh, matrix compared to the data matrix, which which might be huge. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not going to show too much math in the talk, but there's going to be a little bit. There's going to be some formulas here and there. The way you compute the covariance for each element of this matrix is you simply just multiply all the, the data. So this would be uh, time point I in channel X and time point I in channel Y. So as you can see, it's instantaneous. Uh, so we're not, you know, there's no lagging here. So it's instantaneous covariance. And then we simply multiply all of the uh, corresponding um, data values over all the time points. We sum all of those up and divide by N uh, just to, you know, it's just a little normalization factor. And then the data have to be mean scaled uh, or mean centered uh, by subtracting the mean. But uh, yeah, it's, it's mostly just each um, time series, uh, time, time point uh, multiplied, element multiplied, and then sum. Okay, and then, so that's the formula for a covariance. And then just to, um, you know, we don't, I'm not really gonna talk about correlations, but just to show you, this is the formula for a Pearson correlation coefficient. Um, and uh, you can see it's the same as a covariance. And then there's just some uh, normalization on the bottom. So uh, the reason why I say all this is if you're not comfortable or familiar with covariance, you can think of it as the correlation. It's, it's more or less the same way to interpret. Now it turns out that you know if you look at this formula, you might think in MATLAB or Python that you would write a for loop to do all this stuff. But it turns out that in linear algebra, you can write this very compactly 
um, by writing x times x transpose, where x is your data matrix. So that's uh, just a compact way of, of computing the covariance matrix. I'm showing this because that's going to be relevant um, for it later. Um, so this will you'll see this form come up uh, in 10 or 15 minutes or something. But, uh, but, but this is, is just a way of, of doing this without the for loop explicitly. Um, OK, so now back to generalized eigen decomposition for source separation. OK, so here's the thing. Science often involves, not always, but very, very often in science, we have hypotheses, we have control conditions, and we have statistical comparisons between, for example, experiment conditions. So, you know, you have uh, these kinds of trials and these kinds of trials, and you want to know what is different in behavior and what is different in the brain. What are the brain networks that are more active in, uh, in, in these kinds of trials versus these kinds of trials? So wouldn't it be nice if we had a multivariate uh, method that would allow us to, or that would, you know, discover the networks in the brain that specifically separate uh, these are, you know, are maximally different between these kinds of trials versus these kinds of trials. Now, ICA doesn't do that. PCA doesn't do that. Um, uh, decoding doesn't do that. Uh, generalized eigen decomposition does that. So we can uh, define our uh, our spatial filter, our multivariate set of weights. Uh, that maximizes some condition comparison, just like what you would do with an ANOVA, for example. You would compare these trials versus these trials. Um, similar story for time windows. So we often want to know what is different in the brain between this time window when there's a stimulus, a visual stimulus presented, versus this time window when, you know, in the pre-stimulus baseline. Um, again, you know, you can think of univariate methods for this, like a, a t-test on, you know, some some data feature here versus the that data feature here. But the generalized eigen decomposition is going to allow us to directly um, identify a network in the brain or multiple networks in the brain that are specifically different between this time window and this control time window. Now that is really important because there's a lot of information in this time window that reflects um, stable, you know, anatomically defined ongoing background brain signal that has nothing to do with the stimulus. It just has to do with the fact that the, you know, neurons in the brain are not randomly wired uh, or they're not all completely statistically independent from each other. So what we can do with generalized eigen decomposition is say, what are the features in the brain that are different between this time window and this time window? And that means that all of the um, intrinsic background uh, patterns of correlations across the different uh, data channels are going to be normalized out. Those will be ignored. Again, that's not something that you can do with ICA or PCA or, or um, other decoding methods. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, this is just another example. Let's say we want um, to identify a spatial filter, a multivariate component that maximizes energy in some frequency band relative to energy at neighboring frequencies or you know relative to the rest of the broadband spectrum that's also neat because then you know we we can actually look for activity simultaneously but that um, find networks in the brain that that are maximal for uh, ma have maximal energy for one specific uh, frequency and I'll show examples of several of these things uh, a little bit later Okay, so that's a little bit of an introduction. Um, I'm now going to get into a bit more of the math, but I'm, I'm going to try, you know, it's going to be a few equations, but I'm going to try to focus on the, the, the conceptual aspects and not so much on the, the formulas. All right, so, uh, so we want to find this vector w. So how do, we, how do we do this? So the objective that we work with in general eigen decomposition is we say that we take this weighted combination of data from uh, from uh, data window X and data window or data feature Y. And we can call this the signal activity and we can call this a reference activity. So in the examples that I showed in the past few slides, this would be like the experiment condition and this would be the control condition. This would be the uh, post-stimulus time window and this would be the pre-stimulus time window. This would be the narrowband filtered signal and this would be the broadband filtered signal. So just some examples. Now, 
when you take this weighted uh, weighted um, sum of the channels, remember that this result here is just a single time series. And then these vertical lines here indicate the, the, the norm or the, the magnitude of this time series. You can think of it as like the variance. In fact, this is equivalent to variance under some, uh, uh, some assumptions. Uh, but this is like the, the 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 variance of the component time series, and so this is the component uh, or the variance of the component time series with exactly the same weights, but the data are taken from the reference uh, the reference signal. So this is what we want to do. We want to find the set of weights that gives us maximal energy, maximal variability in the um, signal compared to the reference period. Okay, so I hope that part is uh, is straightforward uh, or sensible. Um, so then the question is, how do we define these Ws? How do we pick the W? Um, so I'm, I'm going to start by just rewriting this equation up here. So um, here we have this uh, same form again, and now I'm just writing this out. Now there's going to be a, a bit of linear algebra on this in the next slide. If if you're not familiar with linear algebra, don't worry about it. It's not important. Okay, so. Um, so we can express this magnitude squared as the vector times its transpose, uh, same thing in the denominator. And then, you know, we apply this, uh, the transpose and, and just rewrite that equation. Now this should look familiar, right? This is uh, what I showed um, a couple of slides ago, that this is the covariance matrix of, of uh, data, ma data matrix X. So now we can just replace this with, I'm calling this matrix S for signal and R here for reference. Um, so if you've taken like machine learning courses before, you might recognize this. Um, this is called the uh, the the, the uh, quadratic form ratio or the generalized uh, Rally quotient. Um, another way of writing this out is that we want to maximize uh, W transpose SW, which is a quadratic form on W, subject to um, WRW is one. So this is a, a kind of like normalization that, that is uh, providing a, a constraint for us. Now, this doesn't actually solve the problem. This just gives us a, a way to rewrite the, uh, the problem using uh, the quadratic form on a uh, covariance matrix. Okay, so, so that basically leads to um, this maximization uh, function. This is the thing that we want to optimize for. So we want to find the vector W that maximizes this ratio. Now, this quadratic form here is just a single number, and this is just a single number. So that means that when we plug in some vector w, this whole thing is, is a ratio. It's a ratio of s to r, so the covariance matrix of the signal versus the covariance matrix of the reference, in some direction that's defined by w. And so that ratio is just a, yeah, it's just a single number. So we can call that lambda. Um, this is a slight abuse of, of math terminology. So for the mathematicians in the audience, I, I profusely apologize. But basically, this means that once you've plugged in, uh, once you've identified the maximum, uh, the, the W that maximizes this ratio, then this whole thing just boils down to a single number, and we're going to call that uh, lambda. So the, the goal, the point here is to find the W that maximizes lambda. Okay, so... Uh, I still haven't told you actually how to do that. <laughs> There's, uh, it turns out that the, the way to do that is um, we can start by rewriting this vector W as a matrix W and consider an entire set of solutions, uh, not just a single solution. So if we have M channels and we consider M different uh, solution vectors W, and we put them all into a matrix as columns in a matrix. Now, I have to also have to admit that there's a couple of steps that I'm omitting to get between this equation and this equation. So again, if you're like a the hardcore mathematician, then uh, take a, a glass of cold ice water <laughs> because uh, I, I'm not going to talk about how to actually prove that you get to this equation from here. But, uh, but it's fairly, fairly straightforward. It basically just comes from, from this constraint here. Okay, anyway, so... Um, all I've really done here is write out this equation with matrices instead of vectors. And here I've taken the inverse instead of uh, putting it in the denominator. And again, we can apply a little bit of linear algebra and that brings us to a form that looks something like this. Now this might look familiar to the linear algebraticians amongst you. Um, and uh, in fact, this is the form for a um, eigenvalue decomposition. So then W would be the eigenvectors and lambda would be the eigenvalues. So we take an eigenvalue 
decomposition on this matrix product, R inverse times S. Uh, and then you can also rewrite this here. Now, this form here is called a generalized eigen decomposition. So uh, if you only have one matrix, then it's called an eigen decomposition. If you have two matrices uh, like this, then it's called a generalized eigen decomposition, uh, also sometimes called uh, a, um, a, a, a joint uh, diagonalization of these two matrices uh, because we need lambda to be a, um, uh, a, a, a diagonal matrix. Okay, uh, so if all of this was uh, was Greek, then uh, don't worry about it. The point is that we can solve this problem, which actually comes from uh, this problem here. So maximizing with one set of weights, we want to maximize the energy or the variance of our signal data compared to our reference data. Um, and the solution to that comes from a, a kind of straightforward mathematical procedure called eigen decomposition, or in this case, generalized eigen decomposition. So the spatial filters are in the columns of matrix W, and the lambdas here are in the um, diagonal elements of the uh, of this uh, matrix lambda. So that's uh, that's pretty neat, because uh, the eigen decomposition is, is like a one-shot deal. We don't have to iterate uh, over and over again. Um, it's uh, deterministic in the sense that if you run the analysis repeatedly, you get exactly the same result, which is you know, different from ICA, for example. If you run ICA on the same data over and over again, you're going to get uh, different results. At least uh, you know, for many ICA algorithms, start off with random initial weights and then have some kind of uh, descent um, uh, optimization. OK, um, so uh, let's see. I, I, don't really want to talk so much about regularization, but this is just for the machine learning people um, in the audience. Just to mention that if you're doing these kinds of analyses for real and real data, it's sometimes useful to apply a little bit of uh, regularization. Uh, it helps smooth out the solution. Uh, it helps deal with problems that are, are numerically challenging to solve and so on. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, actually, I want to talk more about this. So, so this is an example of um of uh, of source separation in a, a, a it's like a little toy example um and we can contrast pca and generalized eigen decomposition here so here is our data in channel space so this would be you know imagine you're doing an eeg study for example and you have two channels so a eeg electrode one and electrode two so then all of the uh, little um, dots here correspond to the data, for example, at you know, different time points. So each dot would correspond to a different time point. Now you can see you're, you have a gestalt engine somewhere built into your brain in a billion years of evolution that tells you that this is one stream of data and this is another stream of data. So these are two sources, and you you see that that's your your brain tells you that that's what's going on. But if you do a principal components analysis on these data, you're actually going to find the, that these are the two um, PC vectors. These are the two principal components here, which which uh, it looks wrong, right? You look at this, and it, it's not wrong. I mean, PCA is doing the thing that it's designed to do, uh, but it's not doing source separation. And so here are the same data plotted in PC space. Now, in the principal component space, the data are, are decorrelated. They're not, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not correlated. But you can see that the sources are still um, correlated. They're not separated in the principal component space. So this is just an illustration that highlights the fact that PCA is actually not useful for separating different sources in data when those sources are correlated with each other. It's just doing an orthogonal rotation. It's not actually able to separate out these two streams of data. Now, the generalized eigen decomposition on exactly the same data, these are exactly the same data here, the generalized eigen decomposition, uh, the, the um, eigen vectors here are not constrained to be orthogonal. And furthermore, the generalized eigen decomposition is not actually looking for maximum variance in the way that PCA is looking for maximum variance. GED is looking for um, leveraging the specific variance to separate these two sources. So now these two sources become perfectly separated in the GED space. Um, and um, yeah, if anyone's 
interested, I, you know, I, I can talk later about uh, why this is the case. It essentially has to do with the fact that um, principal component analysis gives you um, orthogonal eigenvectors because you're only working with a symmetric matrix. With GED, we have two symmetric matrices, but their product is uh, is not symmetric. Um, so, so, uh, so this term here is actually a, a non-symmetric matrix, which means the Ws don't need to be um, they're certainly not constrained to be orthogonal. Uh, and that's that's one of the reasons why you, you get this. Uh, so uh, there's a bit more to say about that in theory, but, uh, uh, but I, I hope this, uh, this gives a, a compelling visual picture of the distinction. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more about PCA actually, and that's going to lead into what I consider to be one of the major benefits of generalized eigen decomposition over other source separation methods, one, uh, or over other multivariate methods. One is this ability to really um, uh, pit different conditions or data features against each other. And two is uh, the ability to do null hypothesis testing uh, with generalized eigen decomposition. So this is the um, uh, optimization uh, um, uh, method for um, principal components analysis. Now, remember before, I, th th there was like another, there's a, a second matrix in here. So if you get rid of that R, this is actually what uh, PCA is optimizing for. Now, in, hidden in here is the identity matrix. And there is kind of a null hypothesis of principal components analysis, which is that your data covariance matrix is the identity matrix or some, you know, some scalar times the identity matrix. And what does that mean? That means that you implicitly, when you run a PCA, you're testing against the null hypothesis that every channel in the in your your data set, so every EEG channel, every MRI voxel, every neuron time series LFP data channel, every data channel is completely zero correlated with every other channel. So every neuron in the brain is orthogonal to every other neuron in the brain. That's obviously a ridiculous straw man null hypothesis. So that's not that's not an appropriate uh, null hypothesis. So, uh, but then when we do uh, generalized eigen decomposition, now we have uh, these two covariance matrices in here. And now actually the null hypothesis that we are testing against is that S equals R. Uh, and that means that the, the sort of statistical structure in the brain signal, the multivariate brain signal is the same in these two covariance matrices. Now that is not a ridiculous straw man hypothesis. That's actually a very valid null hypothesis. And let me go back to um, this picture, for example. You know, the null hypothesis would be that the um, covariance structure, the patterns of, of correlations across the different channels is the same in this time window and in this time window. That is definitely not a trivial null hypothesis or, you know, between this frequency band and these uh, flanking frequency bands. Uh, or in the two experiment conditions. Definitely not a trivial null hypothesis. So you can see, in fact, that um, the null hypothesis value would be one. So if you're, uh, if the data are basically the same between S and R, then, uh, then this ratio would be one. And uh, yeah, you know, e even if you have noise, it's, it's gonna be, you know, if you overfit noise, it's gonna be a little bit higher than one, but you can imagine a, you know, sort of a, a a roughly Gaussian distribution around the value of one, and that's your null hypothesis value. So um, that's cool, I think, because it means that null hypothesis testing and inferential statistics are built directly into this, uh, this multivariate uh, analysis method. Okay, so let me show you some pictures. So here we have uh, a covariance matrix. This is our reference covariance matrix. This is the signal covariance matrix. And then what the generalized eigen decomposition is going to do is find the patterns in the data that separate, that distinguish this matrix from this matrix. Now you see that uh, these two, you know, if you, if you lean back and squint your eyes a bit, you'll see that these two matrices are really, really similar. And uh, so that's actually really powerful because all of the similarities between S and R get obliterated, they get wiped out. Uh, they're not considered. So, uh, so, and then all of the patterns that differentiate S from R, that's what the eigen decomposition is going to key off of. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so that's um, uh, a little bit of the intuition. Um, 
Yeah, so so I, I do just want to mention very briefly, this would be, you know, for a way longer discussion, but you do have to um, be uh, mindful of the possibility of overfitting your data. So, you know, there's a couple of different strategies for dealing with overfitting. It's an important issue, um, but it's not conceptually related to um, uh, to uh, um, the, the, the method, the core of the method. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Okay, so now I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about uh, or showing you a couple of examples of GED in simulated data and also in real data. Um, and then I'll, I'll say a couple of uh, closing words. So here is simulate data. So what I did was simulate data in the brain in, in dipoles in the cortex and project the dipole signal out to EEG. So it's a way of simulating EEG data. And what I did was uh, generate um, some alpha activity in one dipole, so 10 hertz uh, signal in one dipole, and then uh, lots of noise in all the other 2,000 dipoles and project them all out. So here you see, uh, if you just look at the EEG, the electrode level activity, filtered, so uh, or not filtered, but this is um, from a, a power spectrum at 10 hertz, you see this, uh, it looks horrible. Right, the noise. There's so much noise in the signal that you don't really see. You know, this is probably coming from the the signal here, uh, but you don't really really recover the signal. And and this electrode here is electrode 31. I picked that electrode because that's the closest to uh, this uh, this um, truth topogra um, topograph. And here's the power spectrum. You know, if you know that there should be more energy at 10 hertz then you see that there but if i just showed you this black power spectrum you, you you might not even think that this is real signal okay and then here of course is the generalized eigen decomposition here's the it's called the scree plot but basically it's all of the the eigenvalues so there's one big eigenvalue and the rest of these are noise and here is the component so this is the weighted combination of all of the data channels and uh, yeah, and now I didn't tell the eigen decomposition that these channels are important. I just told the eigen decomposition to look for 10 hertz activity. And, you know, he figured out the universe, you know, the, the laws of mathematics figured out that this is the right way to put the channels together. Um, and here, yeah, then you see, you know, this, this is quite clear. So we're reducing the dimensionality and we also massively increase the, the signal to noise quality. So. Uh, simulate data, but you know it's always important to start with simulated data um, just to make sure that you know things work as expected. Um, here we have a little bit of real data. So these are channels from uh, or data from uh, sixteen channels that were uh, organized in a, a linear array and implanted into the primate amygdala. So these are the different uh, subregions of the amygdala. Um, here you see uh, the time series from each of the channels. Then we applied a, a generalized eigen decomposition to look for stimulus-related activity. There's different um, kinds of uh, like visual stimuli and auditory and tactile stimuli versus the pre-stimulus baseline here. Um, and uh, yeah, what was re remarkable, so if you look at the, the, the maps that you get, so like the, the weightings, uh, they follow the 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 detailed um, architecture of the amygdala really closely without us having to impose any anatomical restrictions. So somehow, even though the generalized eigen decomposition has zero spatial priors, it doesn't incorporate explicitly incorporate any information about the locations of the electrodes or the distance between electrodes. It doesn't even care about the relative positioning of the electrodes. You could completely randomize the ordering of the channels in the data set, and that doesn't affect the solution. And yet, this method just I, um, uh, really like identified all of the, uh, the boundaries between the different amygdala nuclei, and even uh, kind of discovered some, some new ones uh, that are all in the same region, in this case, you know, all in the, the basal nucleus. And here, so we interpret this as evidence for subpopulations functional subpopulations within the uh, basal nucleus of the amygdala that, that we don't see um, uh, just from the MRI. So there's something about the function. Um, let's see. Uh, so this study here is from a PhD student uh, in my lab. Um, 
the, it would take me a little bit more time to get into the background and the motivation for this study, uh, but it is, it's related to, you know, the sort of frontal data component and conflict that uh, I discussed at the very beginning uh, of the talk. But the basic idea is that in the field, which is, you know, my field, for a long time, we have been thinking that uh, we're operating under the assumption that midfrontal theta is one single unitary, unidimensional uh, computation in the brain. So there's, it's a one dimensional signal. So that was, um, you know, something that I also put forth myself, you know, I made this hypothesis very explicit a couple of years ago, and then we decided to actually test that hypothesis. Um, and so uh, what we did was we took some um, simultaneous MEG and EEG data uh, that were measured at the University of uh, San Francisco, or uh, University of California at San Francisco. These are the covariance matrices for theta filtered data and broadband filtered data. Um, you can see uh, that there are many components. So this is a um, uh, our, our statistical um, threshold here corrected for multiple comparisons. So a total of you know like uh, 320 sensors or something. Um, lots of components in the uh, uh, lots of theta components in the data, uh, and we were specifically interested in components that. You know, had a particular EEG topography, they were modulated by the task and, and responsive to conflict and so on. Um, and then different subjects or nine uh, human subjects had a different, um, different numbers of, of, of theta conflict components, but they're all greater than one. So this is a quite an interesting set of results. You know, I could talk about this for a long time, but basically our conclusion was that actually this model is wrong. Uh, and what's really going on, or you know, what the evidence suggests, what the data suggests, is that uh, frontal conflict actually is existing in this uh, multi-dimensional uh, uh, subspace. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're it's still a bit of a mystery about what exactly that means and what it tells us about computation and so on. But this is really uh, an hypothesis that was in the field for like 15 years, and we proved it wrong. Um, by um, by you know applying this uh, this data analysis method. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm not going to talk about this except to say that the method is um, uh, it doesn't really care about what kind of data you have or where the data come from. So here we mixed um, LFP data and spiking data um, in three different brain regions in a mouse, all into the same model. Um, you do have to worry a little bit about uh, normalization and so on, but that's a, a minor issue. You can put different kinds of data. So here, yeah, this is MEG and EEG. Here, this is spiking and LFP. It all works uh, with the same data. Um, uh, let's see. This is uh, another application of generalized eigen decomposition for defining empirical frequency boundaries. So instead of saying theta is 4 to 8 hertz and alpha is 8 to 12 hertz, you can actually leverage the patterns in the spatial temporal patterns in the data to identify empirically where these frequency boundaries are starting and ending. And this you do for, you know, this is like subject specific. Um, so uh, not going to talk about uh, that in the interest of time, but it, it's a, that's a published method. Let me see. So, um, so I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, if you are interested in doing uh, generalized eigen decomposition or exploring this method in your own data, um, you definitely have to start with an hypothesis. Um, and that's because the whole method is based on um, decomposing or separating these two covariance matrices. So you really need to think very carefully about how to define these two matrices, which data features to use for S and R. Um, it's actually quite simple. So it's really, you know, this would be some MATLAB code. This is the uh, eigen decomposition on these two matrices. Um, and this would be uh, the, the, you know, the largest uh, or the, the eigenvector associated with the largest eigenvalue um, transpose times the data matrix. That's basically in Python. It's a little trickier, to be honest, because um, uh, like NumPy doesn't actually solve this problem. SciPy kind of does, but it's not as numerically stable as MATLAB. But anyway, th there's ways around that. Um, so so that seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> and you do it in practice, it's, it, there's a little bit more to it. There's some, I wouldn't really say tricks, but there's, you know, it, it does take a little bit of experience to be able to do the analysis um, correctly and, and get a good solution. 
Uh, you can always ask me for help. Um, or you can check out this uh, tutorial paper that I wrote. Um, it's on archive. It's it's still currently under review at Neuro Image. Um, here, I try to focus this uh, particular paper on, on a more like kind of comprehensible, practical, hands-on way. So it's a bit more of a tutorial. Um, I there is math in here, but I don't go into super amount of detail about um, all the math. So if you're curious about this method, um, but you are you know you want to read a little bit more about the mathematical basis, then you know you can still check out this paper. Um, there's lots of other papers uh, that approach generalized eigenvalue composition from a more um, uh, kind of detailed math and, and theoretical perspective. Um, this one in particular, I can recommend from Luca Parra. It's a, it's a pretty good one. They call this correlated components analysis. So, but generalized eigenvalue composition is the mathematical backbone behind CCA and lots of other uh, analysis methods. Um, uh, along with my with with my paper here, uh, there's also code <clears throat> on my GitHub page, so you can check out my GitHub page for GED tutorial. There's a Python code and MATLAB code, um, and the tutorial itself is also uh, the PDF is also right there on the on my GitHub page. Um, let's see. So spatial temporal structure in multi-channel data can be leveraged to identify components. In the data, these components are actually estimates of, of underlying computational sources in the brain. Uh, it's important to appreciate that those are only estimates. We don't actually, you know, there's a massive ill-posed problem uh, with generalized eigenvalue composition. So these are, we're really making some assumptions and hoping that we, we can estimate some actual sources in the brain. Um, in general, uh, I believe that multivariate decompositions have uh, uh, many advantages over single channel um, uh, based analyses. Um, uh, generalized eigen decomposition boosts the signal to noise ratio, it en enhances the contrast, it reduces dimensionality, it um, opens up new possibilities for different kinds of analyses that you can test with your data. Um, it's highly amenable to stati st um, statistical inference and, and things like p-values and, 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 th and so on. Um, in principle, it, it works with any multivariate time series data. Um, and uh, yeah, I showed a few examples of this. And yeah, just to highlight uh, what I've said before, you know, I, I would I would definitely not argue that GED is superior to all these other multivariate analysis methods in all cases. It is superior to like ICA uh, and, and decoding for some kinds of things. But in general, you know, if I had one take home message, it would be if you are doing univariate analyses, please reconsider and do multivariate analyses. I, I think any kind of multivariate analysis is going to be um, insightful and, and beneficial. Um, and then, yeah, of course, I have this like slide of like shameless self-promotion. So uh, some of you know I have a couple of books, um, courses, uh, YouTube, as Misha already mentioned, code on GitHub. I'm totally not on social media, so don't even try looking for me on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or any of those things. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, Misha, for inviting me, uh, and thank all of you for your time. And um, if you have questions, I'm happy to stick around till, you know, whenever. So thanks, Mike, for, for this interesting talk. And I already see that we have some questions in the chat. Uh, let's start with one from Joseph Benning, who wrote, just so I understand use cases of GED, is it possible to use in every case that PCA could be used? However, is it better in some cases or are there some cases where PCA could be used, but GED, uh, GID cannot? Right, yeah, uh, good question. So I actually have pretty strong feelings about PCA, the use of PCA um, in neuroscience. And, and those feelings are, are rather negative. <laughs> I don't think... Uh, uh, so, so let me give you two reasons. First of all, PCA is um, is constrained to give orthogonal solutions uh, like this, which on its own is not you know there's nothing intrinsically wrong with PCA, but um, orthogonal solutions are not very useful for neuroscience data you know in the brain where everything is correlated with everything else basically. Um, 
Secondly, the goal of PCA is to find components that maximize variance, period. So maximize the overall level of variance. Uh, and the thing is that, um, so, so in this like uh, multivariate field, uh, we say, we have this saying that uh, variance does not equal relevance. So the direction of maximal variance is not necessarily the most relevant feature of your data. And you can see that here. Uh, you know, the, the, the maximal variance is actually pointing in between these two data streams. And if you think about your data, EEG data, but also, you know, spiking data and things, what are the sources of maximal variance? Uh, what drives the signal the most? It's going to be uh, eye blinks. It's going to be muscle artifacts. Um, it's going to be, you know, some uh, like generic features of the data that, that project to all the electrodes, maybe line noise artifacts. So it's often the case in, in data that, um, that, uh, that PCA is just going to, first of all, mix the sources together, and it's going to point in the direction of of um, of uh, artifacts, so uh, so yeah, I'm not a, a huge fan of of PCA. Um, so there's another question, my next. Yes, we have right. a question from Future Wong. Why S fitting to noise would uh, produce eigenvalue larger than one? Yeah, also a great question. So um, slightly longer uh, discussion about that, but essentially. Uh, what you're doing here is um, is is fitting a model to data, um, and it, there's a lot of parameters. So in this entire matrix W, you have m by m parameters, so m squared parameters. Um, in uh, I guess it's a little bit less because of the symmetry, but anyway, you have uh, a lot of parameters that you're fitting to data. So this method of generalized eigen decomposition involves overfitting, and so anytime you overfit. Um, you're going to get a, you know, a, a sort of, um, you're likely to get a, a positive uh, result. So um, when you overfit noise, then it's just, you know, by, by sampling variability, by random chance, you're likely to get, uh, a you're likely to find a direction in the data where S pushes out a little bit further in the data space compared to R. That's just random. And so in that direction, lambda is going to be greater than one. Yeah. Okay, then we have, of course, a, a simple question from Ali Reza Gavmi, which was actually answered at, as far as I think, unless there's yeah. something that's missing. Did you publish this work? I think yes. Unless there's, of course, anything specific that uh, Ali Reza wanted to know. Yeah, so I can just say very briefly that generalized eigen decomposition is used uh, fairly often. So you may not have heard of generalized eigen decomposition, but you may have heard of or come across papers where it's used. It's also used in like a linear Fisher discriminant uh, analysis. Uh, linear classifiers often use generalized eigen decomposition. Um, lots of components analyses in BCI, they use generalized eigen decomposition. Um, so, uh, so, that, so you might have uh, come across this method even if you didn't see the, the name. So if you look in this paper, you'll see I cite a bunch of other papers. Good. Then we have a question from Jasmine Hemdane. Do you see EG being replaced with other methods like FNIRS for better signal processing analysis, or is it currently superior? Yeah, also an interesting question. Uh, for humans, I, I kind of don't imagine uh, EEG will be completely replaced by FNIRS. Um, EEG is uh, it's so cheap and it's so easy to use. Um, you can literally build, you know, if you're, if you're an engineer and you're into this, you can, you can find blueprints for building your own uh, EEG system. And it's literally going to cost you like, you know, a hundred bucks. Um, so, uh, so I, I don't, re and even, you know, sort of top of the line, high end EEG systems are still in the range of tens of thousands, which is still quite cheap uh, as far as um, uh, brain imaging equipment goes. So, um, uh, yeah, so I, I don't really see EEG completely being replaced, although, you know, <laughs> there's one thing we learned in 2020, it's that you should never predict the future. It's completely pointless. Uh, but yeah, like I said, towards the end, you know, you can use these multivariate methods for any kind of data, not just for EEG. Yeah. So we have a couple of more questions. I think we go for three more questions. We have the questions from 
Jiyun Shin, who is asking, do you have to have a hypothesis to do GID? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, kind of. So you can see that you know you're you're basically trying to find a contrast between these two covariance matrices. So if you don't have a good hypothesis, then uh, it, you know how are you going to pick S and R? And um, yeah, the entire analysis rests on on these two covariance matrices. So if, if these are not well selected or appropriately selected, then it's unlikely that you're going to get a good solution. So do you really have to to choose this carefully? That is one. You know, I don't know if you call it a disadvantage or an advantage, but it's different from real blind source separation methods like ICA, where you just throw all of your data. Uh, into it, and and the data will uh, will decompose according to you know maximizing independence and non Gaussianity and so on. So um, so so GED actually forces you to think carefully and critically about what you're expecting in your data. And in my opinion, that's a good thing. I think that the more your analysis forces you to think about your hypotheses, the the more likely you are to get uh, good results. So I would say last two questions. Is this interpretation correct? In GED, we are trying to find the transformation matrix that project R to S due to the evoked activity. Uh, yeah, interesting question, Ali Reza. So uh, it's not necessarily, so, so whether it's evoked activity per se depends on how you set up your two matrices. Um, so you're probably thinking about that based on this picture here, uh, which is one way to set it up. You can also set up S and R to you know have S be the covariance matrix of the ERP uh, and R to be the covariance matrix average of the single trial data, so the non-phase lock data. Um, so that would be you know another way to to set it up. Um, as for the transformation matrix, yeah, I don't have a slide for this in my. Um, in, uh, I don't have a picture for this in this particular data set, but let me see. I guess, I mean, the answer is yes. Um, uh, I guess one way to visualize it here uh, is here. So you're looking for a transformation matrix that's going to basically warp this space. It's a linear warping, but to warp this space such that the, 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 blue, the, the, the blue cloud is maximally different from the red cloud. And, and that's kind of what's, what's going on here. I hope that makes sense, Ali Reza. Yeah. So last question from Philip Johnston. Super interesting work. I'm wondering what the difference benefits of GID are compared to other techniques that perform multivariant decomposition of two matrices like canonical co mm. correlation or partial least squares correlation. IIRC both. If I recall correctly. <laughs> if I recall correctly, sorry. <laughs> Come on, Misha, you got to uh, get up to speed on your internet. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Of those can be given a contrast matrix that would also allow you to find components that maximally distinguish conditions. Yeah, uh, really interesting question, Philip. Thanks for that. Um, so, so CCA, canonical correlation analysis, is a little bit different. That, that's kind of the opposite of GED. So with GED, you're looking to maximally separate these two matrices um, inside one data set. With um, canonical correlation matrices, you actually start off with two different data sets and you wanna find weighted combinations that make those two data sets maximally correlated with each other. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a very different goal. Um, that could be, you know, I think that would be pretty interesting to do in a data set like, um, this where you know we combined so in this study we pooled the uh, the LFP channels and the spiking channels together but you could say you know if you would do a CCA you would say find the weighted combination of neurons that maximally correlates with some weighted combination of LFP channels so um, I think CCA is a is a great analysis method um, but it's it's a little bit different from the um, generalized agony composition as for um, Partial least squares correlation. I have to say, I, I, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know about that method, so I, I couldn't say. But um, 
Yeah, so you do see, uh, let me see if I have this other site. So basically a, a lot of these multivariate methods um, differ only by their optimization criteria. Um, so I don't have a specific slide about that, but um, so let's see. So uh, GED has this optimization criteria, PCA has uh, this optimization criteria, ICA has uh, optimization criteria that um, the sources should be independent and um, non-Gaussian. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, like some, like deep learning or you know something else would be, um, um, you know, what you're, you're choosing the weights to maximize a categorical uh, prediction. Um, so yeah, all, all of these different methods are are kind of, uh, of uh, related to each other in a in a um, in a yeah sort of a, a semantic uh, conceptual way. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. So thanks, Mike, again for giving us such a nice talk, and also thanks on behalf of the entire Max Planck University Toronto Center. And as Joyce already wrote, we hope to see you sometime in person. Thanks. Yeah, that'd be nice. And thank you guys, everyone, for, uh, for, for participating and for being here.